All right. So uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about asynchronous HTTPS within Q. Um, my motivation for this is actually very similar to Jay. So initially, I started building up a couple of projects that required connections um, out to the web. So especially over here on the West Coast, everyone's building SaaS services. And for smaller test-based stuff, it's really easy to hook up to a SaaS service, so then you don't need the overhead of building something yourself. I mean, even something as simple as, let's say, a web server, it's really nice to hook up to like Mandrel or one of those other guys and just be able to send emails on the fly rather than maintaining your own web server and doing all of those things. Um, requesting data is, is a big one for me. Like I like to connect to different data feeds and also parsing websites. It will be like you can think of a situation where you want to scrape a bunch of websites, standardize the output, and then put it all in a table and persist that table down all into one system. So that was the kind of motivation for that. Um, initially, I was using Node a lot to do a lot of these tasks. But like Jay, I didn't like switching back and forth between two languages. Um, I didn't like maintaining two different processes with basically two different workflows. It started to get really annoying. And I was like, well, can I do better? And uh, this is basically what I came up with. So basically, like I said, everything is in the cloud. But uh, based on what I used before, so Q can do HTTP requests, but there's a couple of uh, difficulties. One is HTTPS requests. It's hard to get that natively. Um, I know there's a way to set it up, but I had a lot of trouble doing that. And the second one is basically all of the requests are sync requests. So you can imagine, uh, and this is an example actually I was talking with Jay about. Imagine if you were going, you were like, let's say, a Bitcoin trader. Uh, for the Bitcoin exchanges at the beginning, all of them were basically HTTP requests. They're, they weren't WebSockets, they weren't push based requests, they were all pull. So each time you want to request a new price in the system, you basically need to pull from that site. Um, if there's any latency in that connection, you basically have to wait till one pull request is done before you go for the second pull request. That can get very annoying, especially if you have one server pulling from multiple sources. Uh, a good example is you're pulling from four different exchanges and you're pulling both their quote feed and their trade feed. When you're thinking about web scraping, you might be scraping from 10 different websites at the same time. You don't want to be doing that serially. You want to basically send out those requests and when they come back, do some logic before sending out a second set. Um, so that's kind of the motivation for the async part. The other part is the HTTPS. Basically, all of these SaaS services, they require some type of authentication. They're generally post requests. So you definitely want to be able to have an HTTPS request, and you want to be able to put in any arbitrary headers into your request in order to basically get that authentication through. Um, so yes, essentially, we want to use web services directly from Q. And that way, we can handle everything in queue. And once that data comes into queue, we can use the power of queue to do what queue is good at, which is parsing stuff, putting stuff in the data, persisting, running logic on top of it. Um, so as we want to leverage what we know. And in this case, it's essentially very uh, similar to Jay's situation. I was looking around for a good library to use. I tried a few different ones. But libcurl was basically the one that I found was most comprehensive. Um, you can basically compile it statically. You can link it up very, very easily. It has basically everything out of the box. It's very powerful. And the um, question is, how do you get that in a queue? So we basically just wrote a wrapper around it. And uh, I actually have the code here. So it is very queue style code. And this is basically the set of requests. Um, so you have your post async here, and then your getters here. And essentially, it just runs a separate loop. Um, it, it creates a separate thread. And then it just runs the select loop over that thing. Uh, I try to lower the overhead as much as possible. So essentially, it just uses pointers and passes pointers back and forth. And that way, you don't recreate data point, uh, basically copy data back and forth between the threads over and over again. So I want to go through some examples. Um, can you guys see that? I like writing code in really small font, because <laughs> that way I see more. <laughs> yeah, this has been a pretty bad habit. So essentially, um, so the thing is, an aside to this is, uh, you'll see a lot of stuff in here that might be a little non-standard. Uh, again, inspired by Node, I really like the way that Node handled the packages. So like when you want to install new files, when you want to run new things, it's pretty much standard. 
Um, so to help myself, because I like writing a lot of libraries, uh, I basically created this like QP package, which is essentially allows you to install things even with um, add-ons into standardized folders, and that way you can just basically run QP to require and then require the packages that you need. So this one, I basically just run this, qp.http, um, and then I just load this package. So the first one is, I'm just going to pull Google data, right? And uh, you can see the way that this works is, you basically put in a callback function here, and this function takes in three parameters. The first one is the data that gets returned, the second one is the uh, response code from the URL, and the third, thing is the response code from curl itself. So you can think of three situations that happens. The first one is you get the data back, everything is nice and peachy, right? And then you should get data, you should get 200 as your HTTP response code, and your curl should return no error. The second issue is if you put in the wrong URL, then you should get some garbage data back most likely. Um, your HTTP response code is going to be non-200, could be something else, and your curl code is zero. And the last one is, for example, if I had no internet, then I should get probably nothing back for the data, nothing back on the response code, and I should get a non-zero response code back for uh, the curl one. So this should cover all three of this, those situations. Um, I wrote something very simple here. Basically, I said I just want this thing to succeed. So if the response code is 200 and curl is zero, then give me back my HTML data. Um, otherwise, give me back an error. So. I can run this, and then if I come over here and type in HTML, you'll see that I have Google as a web page down here. Um, and you saw that the response is basically instant, even though the pool probably takes like 200 to 400 milliseconds here. Uh, the second one is I'm going to pull a website that I'm hoping is fake. And then you can see here, if I look at error, you'll see that is 0, 06, right? So it can't resolve the DNS, and then we know that there's an error. Um, I created this helper function called pipe, which essentially does this, because you can think of it as you really only care about two states of the world um, in general, right? One is you get the data that you want back, and the second is something else happens. So basically, this pipe function kind of abstracts away this part, and just allows you to say, well, if it's success, then I get the data back. If it's not, I want my two response codes back. Just makes things a lot easier. Um, so let me open up 1235. So with 1235, what I did was I basically just copied the usual.z.ph function. And I added in here. So I want to get the response. Uh, I want to copy the response back here. So I'm going to run that. And then. Um, what I can do here is basically there's three functions. There's one that's get async, which is the simplest just getter function. There's get async h, which is a getter function that allows you to put in arbitrary headers. And the third one is um, post async, which allows you to post with appropriate headers and appropriate data. So I'm going to run get async h here. And what you'll see is uh, so I basically ran it against this. What you see here is that you can see that I have my authorization as well as my arbitrary other tag, which I specified over here, the auth and the other tag. And it's basically just a list of strings. And that way I can put in any arbitrary header I want, which satisfies at least with the services I've looked at um, most of the requirements that they have. So the question is, what can you do with this? Well, I have four examples I have here. And um, so I'm in finance. I care a lot about data. And I like the fact that I can pull arbitrary data together to link them and to basically sort them out within Q. Uh, so the first example I have is literally pulling data from the OCC, so basically the options clearing exchange. Uh, the second one is what I was talking about before with Mandrel. So basically, I don't need to set up my own web server. I can basically have Q send me emails each time it needs to upload data. Uh, uh, for example, let's say I have a um, data scraping request. It goes through a certain amount of data, and I want to know which ones succeeded and which ones failed. Once I have that, I want it to email me a nice condensed report. That would be really nice. But I only want to run Q on that system. So. By hooking it up to Mandrel, I don't need to set up a web server. Everything can be super lightweight, and I can just send it through Mandrel's uh, system. Uh, 
The third one I want to look at is Quandl, which is basically a place that you can find a lot of data. Um, this one's really nice because essentially Quandl already presents this data in table form. If we can pull it directly into Q, we can essentially do any type of analysis on a whole host of data from, for example, common market data to real estate, venture cap, uh, GDP data. It basically unlocks your world in terms of the analysis that you can do within here. Um, and another one, this is li my little pet thing, is uh, Bitcoin, just because this is a very interesting market, but that's a separate story. Uh, so this is basically using Bitfinex's API. I think Bitfinex, actually Bitfinex probably doesn't have a WebSocket connection. I think Bitstamp does. But a lot of these, especially the um, le less uh, above board, uh, Bitcoin exchanges, they basically only have HTTP requests because a lot of them traditionally build out these platforms using like a Node framework or a Django framework. So um, they don't have push uh, anything really. This way you can basically have a bunch of async requests, have this thing go on like every 30 seconds and then not worry about the fact that maybe their internet's going to be slow and everything's going to lag and then you're going to have late prices. If it lags, you've already sent out three requests, you're going to get three requests back at the same time, you should be okay. So from a trading perspective, this is actually very good and you can actually make this thing abstracted out to something that mimics a push strategy as well. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing here, I'm just going to require all four of these packages. Cool. So the first one is I want to make sure that the internet works, but this is essentially sending an email to myself. Um, I'm going to send this and then let's take a look at what XX says. So it says here, it's me, I sent it, it gave me an ID, and if I look at my phone, I should have gotten a message. So it's pretty easy. I actually use this to manage a lot of the processes that I have running, just simply because you know that as long as you have an internet connection and you need an internet connection if you're pulling anything from online, um, you can successfully send out an email. It's pretty handy. Uh, the nice one is they both handle emails and also HTML emails and they also handle attachments. So if you want to actually send a PDF or anything else to yourself, you can do so just via this as well. It's very, very flexible. Um, so yeah, this one would be the H1. The second one I want to show you is Quando. So this one is pretty nice. Right here, I can pull USA and GDP. So this is USA GDP price series. If we take a look at this, we basically see we can get all these values and we can just typecast the data if we wanted to. So I can get data on anything I want off of a single request. I can run 10 of these in a series just by writing at each statement over here and I can pull time series of GDP of the entire world to run my analysis. It's pretty nice. Um, and this one is basically NASDAQ data, so Apple, everyone loves Apple. And if we take a look at this, once it loads, there you go. So there you go, Apple data, and it comes in async. So once you request the data, you don't need to wait for it to finish, right? You can write the logic about it finishing in the callback. Um, you can basically have the program go ahead and do anything else. It basically uh, completely changes your workflow. And once the data comes back, you can let the logic handle that part and go on to something else. For Bitcoin, this is um, Bitfinex request quotes. And I'm just going to request a quote from Bitfinex. Hopefully Bitfinex has not crashed. And there you go. Some Bitcoin data. Um, I can hit the request again. And some more data. So you can just keep on pushing this thing over and over again. Uh, this is OCC, you can get OCC data and then we can take a look at OCC volume for today for example. And there you go. So this is the open interest on Microsoft, uh, Microsoft options for every single strike and every single expiry for today and you can see what the open interest is. So you can think of a situation where if you want to do some end of day research you can just pull data from OCC into your system. You can pull data from um, Quando and get the stock prices in. You can pull data from Yahoo and get the dividend and splits in, like from a financial perspective. Merge all of them together and then try to see, okay, so where in here do I see some trends? What do I think is important? Um, once you're done with that, you can basically run the analysis, maybe even use a plotting tool, generate some plots, right? And then put it in Mandrill and then send it to yourself. 
So it streamlines the entire process. You can do everything within queue, and you don't really have to worry about going out to another system, which I, I absolutely love. Um, and the last example is Yahoo. So we can take a look at Microsoft from Yahoo's perspective. And then there you go. And this is basically the data that we just scraped directly off of Yahoo, which is pretty, pretty nice as well. And you can see here, everything is essentially just very Q style. You give it the callback. Yahoo comes back with a CSV. You tell it that it's a CSV. And then it just loads it in here. So it's pretty nice. Um, so how does it work? It is, I'm not going into as much detail about this, but essentially the way that it works is when you load in the shared library, it spins up a separate thread. Um, and that spread thread is essentially used purely for the curl operations. Uh, curl essentially does native HTTP multiplexing. So the way that it works is whenever you send a request into Q, Q will send that request into that separate thread. That spread will do, thread will do its processing, do all of the management there. And then once it's done, it basically sends a notification back into the main thread. And then the main thread takes that data, returns it, and then cleans up all of the objects that it created. Because um, one rule in Q is you have to destroy the objects that you created in the same thread. So that gets over that hurdle. Um, and then that way, you basically never lock the main Q process at all. And the entire thing is pretty lightweight because you don't really send copies of data back and forth. You create the data in the main thread and give it a reference in a separate thread. So everything else is worked on by pointers. Um, it essentially makes things fairly quick and also especially for larger data sets. Like for example, uh, a bigger data set is, let's say I want to pull like P2P's hot these days. If I want to pull all loan data historically for like P2P loans on Lending Club, uh, that's gigabytes worth of data. But you can still send it through an HTTP request. Once it comes back, you can basically load it directly into queue without doing any copying, which is pretty nice. Um, so what can we do with this? We went through some of these examples. We can do a lot more. Basically, as long as anything has an HTTP hook, you can actually even use this for something like GitHub if you wanted to, because GitHub has an HTTP hook. Um, you can basically hook it into queue and then apply whatever other logic you want within Q. Uh, it basically opens up your world to anything anybody else has created in, in there. Uh, further improvements. This is the current one I'm working on. Uh, I've ran out of time a little bit, but I intend on finishing this in the future. So it's streaming data. This one is mainly for Twitter. So there's a few services that essentially run this kind of weird uh, HTTP request. Instead of doing like a WebSocket or something, they basically open up an HTTP request, start streaming data through, and then never close that request. And their logic is basically, as long as you keep reading that data, then this is basically like a push system. So they keep it open forever. This is how um, Twitter's Firehose works. Uh, there's a little modification that needs to be done in here. So essentially, right now, I have this thing sent back full requests back. But all I have to do is just say, OK, if you're requesting it as a streaming service, then pass the messages along directly, and then you'll be OK. Um, but that opens your world at least to Twitter data, which you can basically capture. Uh, it gen generally comes back in JSON files. So luckily, Q now handles JSON pretty nicely. Um, and then you can basically create a table out of that and then just persist that straight down. So now you get Twitter data in, you can mix it in with all the other data that you have. And the last part is a static library compilation. So like libcurl, uh, one thing I really liked is actually QML. So QML basically compiles statically. So QML is basically the math library, and I use that pretty extensively. Um, right now, I have this on compiling onto the shared library, which is pretty good, but it makes it not that portable. Uh, so I intend on making this more of a static library in the flavor of QML, so that way you can basically just download this thing, run it, and then it fully compiles, and you should be good to go. So those are the last two changes that I'm thinking of this library, then otherwise I think it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, so any questions about this? Yeah. Have a question. Uh -huh. Yes. So uh, other services that expose uh, their data in not through HTTP per se, but say protobuf or Swift or some other binary data formats that you can handle too? Um, would you like to add some or do you notice any 
Like, right now, mainly for me, it was just uh, there were a lot of like to really build something. It was a more of a convenience thing, right? Because I wanted to say, okay, there are these services that I can use essentially for free, um, and it makes no sense for me to actually run them myself. Uh, all of them just happen to be HTTP requests, but. It, I think curl does handle a lot of different protocols. So as long as curl can handle it, this thing can handle it natively. Because it basically reads it off of the protocol right at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right. Cool.